Today, we'll be discussing CSEC agricultural science, and our topic will concentrate on animal nutrition and feeding. I'm Janet Y. Taylor. And so we're going to go straight into our lesson, students. Remember to keep safe and stay focused. And so the objectives we want to achieve this morning, I want you at the end of this lesson to be able to name and state the roles of the constituents of animal feeds and feed, new, and feed ration. Two, state the use of materials from food processing in animal feedstuffs. Three, describe the essential constituents of a balanced ration and choose appropriate rations for different stages of growth in poultry. And finally, calculate the feed conversion ratio and explain its importance. We also want to take a look also how animal nutrition, we're going to tie that up as well in your broiler SBA. So by definition, students, nutrition is a process by which animals eat and use food. When animals have proper nutrition, they are able to increase feed efficiency and also increase rate of gain. Nutrients, when we look at a nutrient, it is a substance that is necessary for an organism to live and grow. Nutrients make it possible for animals to carry out life processes. And nutrients are provided to animals through feedstuff. That includes feed and water. Now, where animals get their nutrients from? Animals are going to get their nutrients from plants, plant products, and also from animal products. From plant products, they are going to get it from grasses, forage crops and legumes, from plant products such as soya beans, oat bran, rice husk, just to name a few, and from animal products, bone meal, milk, and also fish meal. Now, animal needs six essential nutrients in order to grow and to develop. And these are water, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, minerals, and vitamins. Let us take a close look at water, because water is very important for animals. It is necessary for the animals to live. Water makes up 75% of the weight of an animal's body. And students, animals can live longer without food than water. Water is important because it provides animals with, for them to be able to carry out their biochemical processes and also to regulate their body functions. Let's take a look at carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, on the other hand, are energy producing foods and should make up 75% of an animal's diet. Animals need energy for metabolic activity, physical work, and also for the production of meat, milk, and eggs. Now, we're not, we are now going to look at types and sources of carbohydrates. And we have three types. We have the monosaccharides, for example, simple sugars such as glucose, disaccharides, for example, maltose, and polysaccharides such as starch and cellulose. And from plant sources, we are getting carbohydrates from pasture grasses, plant products such as root crops, fruits, seeds, and also grains. Now, students, energy is very important in an animal's diet. If energy is not there, the animals are going to show signs of deficiency because energy is very important for the animals to grow and to do well. So if energy is not there in their diet, these animals are going to become malnourished. And if they are malnourished, especially if animals are grazing, these animals will not be able to do well if they cannot get enough energy from the pasture grass that they're eating. And this may happen too if, they, if the grass that they're getting is inadequate 
or if they are doing what we call overgrazing, they are eating that grass way, way down too low. If, the, if, if during the time of grazing we are going through a period of drought, then we are going to have what we call poor quality food or what we call grasses as well. And sometimes when they take in the forage, it may contain an excess of water limiting the energy intake. And so the animal is going to suffer from malnutrition. And so these are some symptoms, students, that we'll be able to see if the animal is suffering from malnutrition. And so we have to remember, you know, that 75% of their diet should really be energy. Good? Because animals need energy in order for them to grow and to carry out their daily activities. Right? So this is very, very important for you to understand. Good? So... It, if the energy is not there, it is going to retard the growth in the young animals. Good? It's going to shorten the lactation in milking animals and also have a decline in milk production. In mature animals, if there's a deficiency in energy, there's going to be a marked loss of body weight, especially during late pregnancy and early lactation. Prolonged periods of anestrus lasting several months, which have marked effect on the reproductive performance of a breeding herd. And calves and lambs may be born weak and also undersized. Let's move on now to look at proteins. Proteins are organic compounds made up of amino acids. Animal needs proteins for building new cells and tissues, including muscles, producing milk, eggs, wool, hair, and feathers. They also need protein for body maintenance, that is the repair and replacement of tissues, and also for producing enzymes and hormones. Sources of proteins from the plants, we have pasta legumes, cowpeas, and soya beans. And from animal products, fish meal, bone meal, and also blood meal. These are some sources of protein for our farm animals. Like energy students, protein deficiency could also be present in animals if they are malnourished. And even though it may not be what we call as advanced as energy deficiency, there will still be some amount of deficiency in animals if they are lacking in protein. Because protein and energy is very important in the diets of our animals. And for protein, especially for our younger animals. So if young animals are not getting enough protein, we are going to have what we call reduced appetite in those young animals. They are not going to want to eat, lowered feed intake, lack of muscle development, a prolonged time to reach maturity. And in mature animals, there's loss of weight and also decreased milk production. Now, in terms of prevention, control, and treatment, once the animal becomes malnourished, that means lacking what we call the essential nutrients, for example, carbohydrates and protein, most small farmers are not able to correct this. This is beyond their reach. And so I encourage farmers, and even us as we practice agriculture as practitioners, to ensure that our animals never reach that stage of malnutrition. Because once malnutrition set in, it's very difficult to, what we say, correct it. But if the animal becomes malnourished, for example, there are some ways that we could alleviate this malnutrition. So, for example, we can carry out deworming in cattle or in the other animals to make sure that they are getting the nutrients from the food that they are eating. When, because we are unable to correct severe malnutrition students, it therefore means that as farmers do, what we need to do is to sell those animals or slaughter them once they become very weak because the condition will worsen and the animals will go further down. Also, once the animal becomes malnourished, the animal should not be forced to be productive. For example, that is by putting them to work because this will only worsen the condition. Good? Let us move on now to look at fats and lipids. Fats and lipids are made up of what we call fatty acids and glycerol. 
fats have 2.25 times more energy than carbohydrates and are used to supply energy and also to store energy. Once the animal has surplus fat, or what we say is going to be stored underneath the skin and surplus energy from carbohydrates is converted to fat. Sources of fat for farm animals may come from cut meal and linseed meal or even from fish oil as well, for example, for our dairy cattle. Let's move on now to look at vitamins. Vitamins are organic compounds required in the diet in small quantities for healthy growth and development. And we have placed our vitamins into two groups. One we call the fat-soluble vitamins, such as vitamins A, D, E, and K, and water-soluble vitamins, such as vitamins B and C. Now students, even though vitamins are required in small quantities, they play a very important role in the health and development and growth of our farm animals. And if these vitamins are not present, that we outlined before, the fat-soluble vitamins or the water-soluble vitamins, you're going to see some signs of deficiency. For example, retard growth in farm animals, poor reproduction, skin ailments, hemorrhage, such as that means overbleeding, they're going to have diarrhea, night blindness, rough coat, and even muscular problems. So vitamins are very important in the diet of our farm animals. And so we are then able to get vitamins from different sources. The farmer can buy the vitamin from the farm store. You can get supplements. And then also the animals are now able to get vitamins from the pasta grasses, the cereal grains that they consume, and they can also obtain vitamin D from the sunshine. So there are different sources that they are able to garner their vitamins. Let's move on now to look at minerals. Minerals are important too, and they promote healthy growth and development of our farm animals. They are very important because if they are not there, then the animal is also going to see some deficiency. You're going to see some lack because minerals, they all have what we call specific roles in the body of farm animals. And when we talk about the minerals, there are 16 essential mineral element students and they are divided into what we call macro and micro elements. Macro meaning that the animals are going to need these minerals in large quantities and micro elements mean that they're going to need these in what we call small or trace quantities. And so some examples of macro elements, we have nitrogen, calcium, phosphorus, and potassium, and examples of what we call the microelements are like your zinc, your boron, and your copper. So, we want to take a look at two of those macronutrients and the specific role that they play in the lives of our farm animals. And we want to look at calcium and phosphorus. When the animal have these minerals in their body, they, it will not allow them to have strong bones and teeth, and for poultry, they are going to have what we call stronger eggshells. That means they will not break easily. And also for dairy cattle, calcium and phosphorus is going to help to prevent milk fever as well. So what we have looked at so far, students, we have looked at the six essential um, nutrients that farm animals need in order to grow and to do well. We have looked at water. We have looked at carbohydrates. We have looked at proteins, we have looked at fats and oils, we have looked at vitamins, and we have also looked at minerals. And we realize that when these nutrients are lacking, that the animals will show signs of deficiency, they'll not be able to produce as well as they should, and if they are not able to produce as well as they should, it is going to mean that it's going to affect our profit. And once the profit is affected, it means that you and I are going to be having trouble in terms of continuing the practice of agriculture in such a way that we really want to be able to carry it out. Good? Now, we now need to find out some sources of minerals. 
where will the farm animals get their sources of minerals? And so they'll be able to get their sources from the crops that they eat, right? They'll also get their sources from cereal grains such as rice and corn and also from mineral licks. As you can see in the picture right there where the sheep, they're actually licking that mineral lick in order to get additional minerals if they are not able to get it in the pasture grasses that they are eating. They can also get mineral too from bone meal, fish meal and blood meal as well. We now want to look at some materials that we use for livestock feed. And when we talk about materials, some of these materials, we get them locally as well as imported. And so we are able to get the materials for the livestock feed from the grasses that they eat, the legumes, the root crops and the vegetables. They may get the, we may get the materials too from bagasse and molasses from the processing of sugar cane, from fish meal also from fish, rice bran from rice, Wheat middling, we could also get it from the citrus industry, the citrus pulp. We could also get it from coconut meal, from the coconut industry. We could also get it from the bronze industry. All of these are different materials that we can get from different industry so that our animals can do well. And don't forget, for, for example, for pigs, we can give them swills. That means the leftover food materials, the peeling skin, the waste stuff that we don't want, like the, the cabbage and all of those things, we can put that in and we give it to our pigs as well, and they'll be able to get nutrients from those materials. Now, let us recap by looking at a past paper question. Because as we go through students, and every time you complete a topic, you need to go now to look to see if you can answer questions and how you'll be able to answer them. Because at the end of the day, we want to prepare you so that you're able to do well, not just to do well, but to do excellent in all of your subjects. Good? So we want to look at this question. Fish provide high quality protein for human consumption and is a feed supplement for livestock. Explain two ways in which fish can be utilized as supplements for livestock feed. So all along we have been talking about fish meal. Let me just go in to explain. So when we talk about fish meal, we can use a fish head. We can use all the waste from the fish. So if you go to the, let us say you go to the seaside, all of that can be done when they clean the fish. And also they may also catch some fish too that is not used for human consumption. All of that can be processed, grind up to make what we call a fish cake, and then place in the feed as a supplement to ensure that the, the diet or the, the concentrate that we give to the animals are going to be rich in protein. So that is one way in which we can supplement their diet from fish. Another way is by using fish oil. Some, anim some fish are able to produce a lot of oil. We can use that now as a supplement as well. And this is used mainly in the dairy industry because those dairy animals are going to need what we call the extra omega-3. So to answer the question, the two supplements may be from the fish cake, I mean from the fish cake and also from the fish oil. Good? Let us move on now to look at ration and the types of ration that we need to feed our farm animals. So when we talk about ration students, we are referring to the type, quality, and quantity of food that is fed to a particular farm animal or a group of animals. And once you have the ration that you want to feed your animals, the ration should provide the maintenance requirement for the animal as well as the production requirement. Once we start preparing food for animals, we now need to think or consider, consider the following factors. We now need to think that based on the type, the quality or the quantity of food, we now need to think that if we're going to feed these animals, we need to consider the age of the animal, the physical condition of the animal, the stage of growth they have reached, and also the essential food nutrients that the animals need. These, we have to think about these questions first before we go ahead now to prepare their ration. Because for younger animals, they are going to need more protein in their ration than for older animals. 
Let us now look at types of ration. We have three types of ration. We have the maintenance ration, we have the production ration, and we have a balanced ration. So now we want to look at the maintenance ration. And the maintenance ration is a diet which satisfies the energy and protein needs of the animal. It provides for body repairs and metabolic processes without any gain or loss in its stored energy reserves or body weight. Is the extra food added to the maintenance requirement which is used by the farm animal for productive purposes, such as for meat, milk, eggs, hair, wool, and offspring result also from the production ration. We want to zero in now to look at a balanced ration. Once we talk about the balanced ration, it must consist of all the essential nutrients in amounts needed to satisfy both maintenance and production requirements of the animal. A balanced ration also students should supply all the essential food constituents. It must have the correct proportion of energy to protein as well as vitamins and minerals. And the balanced ration too is usually more palatable and satisfies the animal's appetite. So we have to pay attention. We have to make sure that when we feed our animals, we are giving them a balanced ration. Good? There must be adequate amount of maintenance requirement there and production requirement so that our animals will be able to grow and develop and to do well. Because remember, we have a time frame too that we are going to need to get those animals out to slaughter them and to sell them. So when the animal have a balanced diet, they'll be able to reach that at the shortest possible time. Let us now recap by looking at a past paper question. And this time I want to look at a multiple choice question. Right, students? And so as we go through now, I want to be able now to match your answer with my answer. Good? Are you ready? Okay, let us go. Which of the following should give a farmer precise information on the effectiveness of feed given to broilers? Let's look at the different answers we have here. Is it A, stage of maturity of birds? B, commercial ration label? C, conversion ratio? And D, health of the birds? What do you have for your answer, students? All right, so we both have the same answer. All of us, we have the same answer. The answer is B, commercial ration label. Let us now move on to look at appropriate ration for livestock. So when we feed our livestock, we can feed them with forages. We can feed them with concentrates. We can feed them also with fodder. We have different types of appropriate ration for our livestock. And so I want you to understand what we mean by all of these different rations and the sources that we'll be able to get these rations from. So let us take a look now at forages. We get forages for our farm animals from green pasture grasses, legumes, mulberry, and neem. The farm animals, and we're talking basically on what we call animals that are grazing. The farm animals are allowed to either graze or forage, or they could have the forages when you cut them and you're able to feed them in their stalls. Forages also include thick, fleshy, juicy stems, roots, fruits and leaves of certain crops, such as sweet potato, cassava, and banana. Fodder, these are dried stuffs such as A, straws, and chaff, and they are usually used when forage is unavailable, and that could also include chopped feedstuff, such as corn stalks, elephant grass, and kudzu. And the next type of ration we could give them is silage, and this is pasture grasses and legumes and other crops that are conserved and stored in silos. So let us now move on to look at concentrates. And when we talk about concentrates, these are commercially produced food, and they are normally, we normally, they are produced into what we call feed mills, and we could use both local and imported feedstuffs. 
commercial concentrates are designed to suit the maintenance and the production needs of different farm animals. And so the concentrate could be mixed. It could be mashed. It could be ground, granular, or pelleted. Or the concentrate could be high in protein, that is for younger animals, or it could be one that is low in protein for older animals. The concentrate could be high in fiber or low in fiber. It could be high in carbohydrate and also very rich in essential vitamins and minerals. Different types of concentrates are out there, students, so that we are able to meet the needs of our animals. Let us now move on now to look at ration for broilers and layers. And I want to pay keen attention because you know that we have that broiler SBA to complete. And we need to be able to complete that at good enough time that the teachers will be able to mark them and you'll be able to get back your corrections and then you have to put everything together good. And you remember that we are doing the broiler SBA for both single award and double award students in CSEC Agricultural Science. So when we look at ration for broilers and layers, we have to consider certain questions too. We have to then ask ourselves the question before we even go into the farm store now to buy that ration. What is the stage of growth of development that you're going to need the ration for? Yes, you want to know the name of the ration that you need to purchase for your animal. And you also have to think about cost because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we make a profit. Good? So the stage of growth of development, you have to then ask yourself the question based on the poultry. Are we going to raise some chicks? Are the adult broilers we need the ration for? Or, are, or is the ration for pullet or lane ends? You also need to know the name of the ration for broilers and layers. Starter, grower, finisher, layer, or for egg production. And when we think about cost, you want to make sure that the high protein feeds the starters are usually more expensive than low protein feeds, such as the finisher. But you need to know based on the age of the animal, which feed you need to give that animal. Good? Let us now go in to look at the names of the poultry ration. So we have the starter ration. The starter ration is given to broilers from their day old chicks until they are six weeks old. Good? Pay attention to that, students. The grow ration, on the other hand, are given to layers until they are 15 weeks old. And the lane ration is given to layers when they are 15 weeks old and right up until when we cull them. And the finisher ration is given to broilers from they are seven to nine weeks old. But usually, students, for us here in Jamaica, or in the Caribbean, we are taking out our broilers at week five or week six. So therefore, we need to know which ration to buy for the broilers that we are raising at our schools. Good? Let us look at this other question. Let us recap and look at this question. Because so far, we have looked at the different um, nutrients that the animals are going to need. We are now looking at the ration now for broilers and layers. Question, broilers are slaughtered at six weeks old. The most suitable ration for a five-week-old broiler is, is it A, millet, B, starter, C, grower, or is it D, finisher? So based on what we have just discussed, students, the answer would have been B, starter, because we are getting out our chickens at six weeks old. Good. So now we need to move on now to look at feed conversion ratio. And you must understand, students, how to work the feed conversion ratio because this is important for you to complete your SBA. And feed conversion ratio, we normally use the acronym FCR. Good. So remember that you have to work out some things in your SBA. You have to work out your dressing percentage. So when you slaughter your animals, and you have dressed them, we call that the dress weight, which of course you must know. And then now, because we are feeding the animals from day one to six weeks old, you then must make a table that you're able now to keep your records of the total feed that you're going to feed your animals. And remember students, for example, your broilers, when you have them in the brooder, 
they will not eat a lot in that first week. They'll drink a lot of water. If you put too much feed in there for those young baby chicks in the brooder, they are going to waste the feed. And remember that you have to give them fresh feed every day. So if you pay attention in brooding, you, and if you don't waste the feed, it means that you're operating at, in an efficient way. And then that is going to have an impact also on your feed conversion ratio. So feed conversion ratio, students, is the number of units of feed per kilogram an animal uses to produce one unit kilogram increase in body weight or one unit of product. So if I come to class and I say to you that the chickens have a feed conversion ratio of two to one, I am saying to you that the chickens will be able, they need to consume two kilograms of feed in order to put on one kilogram of weight. When we know the feed conversion ratio, we are able to do other things. We are then able to what we call work out our budget then based on the number of chickens that we are going to raise so that we know how many bags of feed to buy. So when you do your proposed budget, you're then able to compare that with your actual budget in your SBA so that you know exactly what you're doing. So the feed conversion ratio is very, very important because you want to know if the chickens that you buy from your farm store, if they are efficient feeders. Because if they are able, if you're saying that you are raising chickens and at the end of the six weeks, you're getting like a feed conversion ratio of four to one, it means that something is wrong. Because you're saying that your chickens are going to need four kilograms of food in order to put on one kilogram of body weight. And that is not good. And that is why it is important for us as farmers and practitioners to pay attention to the efficiency or what we call the feed conversion ratio when we raise our broilers and our animals. So, once we talk about the feed conversion ratio students, it, indi it is indicated how efficiently the animal is going to convert feed into products. This ratio is also associated with economics in terms of the cost of the feed to the farmer. The efficiency of conversion can vary among animals of the same breed and in the same litter. And a young animal converts feed more efficiently than older animals. Good? And so that is why we need to pay close attention to the feed conversion ratio. That is why many farmers don't make any profit when they raise their chickens at home. You can't be raising 50 chickens and you're using 20 bags of feed. Something is wrong with that. And so we need to understand the importance of working out or knowing how to work out or how to deal with the SCR or what we call the feed conversion ratio. So there's a table here that gives us an idea of the different animals and their feed conversion ratio. And so when you raise your broilers, at your different schools, you then need to work out your feed conversion ratio to see if you're doing better than what they have here because it is very important for you to always compare to see if you're right there in the average or you're doing better if it is lower or you're way above that because that is very, very important because it means that you need to go back and look at your management practices in order to ensure that you're having what we call a good feed conversion ratio. So for cattle students, the feed conversion ratio is 4 to 4.5 to 1. That means for cattle, they need 4 or 5 kilograms of food in order to put on 1 kilogram of weight. Good? For pigs, we're talking about 3.5 to 4. They need 3.5 to 4 kilograms of food in order to put on 1 kilogram of body weight. And goats and cattle, they are in the same category, requiring 4.5 to 5 kilograms of food in order to put on one kilogram of weight. And rabbits and chickens, we are looking at them because their average is 3 to 3.5 kilograms of food that they need to consume in order to put on one kilogram of body weight. So when you raise your chickens now, students, remember, you need to now work out your feed conversion ratio. So I'm now going to move on now to look at how we calculate the feed conversion ratio. Good? Now, when we're going to calculate the feed conversion ratio, you need to know 
the amount of feed that you're going to feed the animals, and you're also going to need to know your dress carcass weight at the end of raising your broilers. So the formula states that FCR is the total amount of feed consumed by the animals divided by the total amount of product produced at the end of slaughtering, or we could refer to that as the dress carcass. Let's also look at this example, students. A chicken farmer produces 1,000 kilograms of chicken carcass in six weeks. The birds consumed a total of 2,200 kilograms of feed. Calculate the FCR. So, remember the FCR is the total amount of feed consumed over the, over the total amount of product produced or what we call the dress carcass or the chicken carcass. So here we have the total amount of feed consumed during that, during that six weeks, 2,200 kilograms divided by the dress carcass, which is 1,000 kilograms. And so this farmer is seeing a feed conversion ratio of 2.2. This is excellent feed conversion ratio, yes? Because he's now able to use 2.2 kilograms of feed to give the animals to put on one kilogram of weight. So remember, students, keep your records when you're working also that you can calculate your FCR correctly at the end of the six weeks. So some students also, they raised some chickens, 100 chickens. At the end of the period, they were able to obtain an FCR of 2.73 to 1. That is still a good feed conversion ratio because remember for chickens and rabbits, we are looking at 3 to 3.5 to 1. So this is excellent. It means that the management practices, they are doing very, very well. The importance of FCR, as I wrap up with you now, is to estimate the amount of feed required to feed an animal for its growing cycle. Also, to determine if rearing a certain type of animal will be profitable, because sometimes it's not. 